Welcome back, everyone. I'm Chris Rivers. And I'm Mandy Mack. Yes, and we're Poe on the Car. We're so excited to be here with Riker of Poe Diversity. Hey, everyone. <laughs> thank, thank you thank so, you so much, much for, for being, for being here. here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, happy to be here. <laughs> And then, so I guess we should um, get started with one of our uh, questions that always begins the interview. Um, what what brought you first to pole dance? Yeah, so, um, well, yeah, so I've been pole dancing, so I think for about almost 12 years now. <laughs> um, and I was always, like, really interested in different athletic disciplines. Like, I started out doing basketball was my passion for a long time. And then I did like a lot of skating and things like that um, and dance and weightlifting. And at some point I was taking, a, I think, dance classes and I saw an ad for pole dancing lessons, um, you know, just on the board there. And um, I looked up some YouTube videos and was like, oh, that looks super cool and like something that I would want to try. Um, and so, yeah, I tried it out and it just felt like a perfect fit for my body. Um, cause I was always like, I loved watching dance. I, I think dance is so beautiful. I love watching ballet and things like that, but I never quite felt like I fit in, um, for various reasons. Um, and you know, sometimes they even actually told me my shoulders were too big in ballet, <laughs> But then when I uh, took pole, it was like, you know, it just felt like a perfect fit. So having all the upper body strength and and liking using upper body strength um, just made it really natural for me. And I just, yeah, it was my passion after that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I can't believe they actually told you something about your shoulders in ballet. That is awful. Yeah. <laughs> ballet is ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do like ballet though. But it is it ridiculous. Is, I mean, <laughs> a lot of things I appreciate about it, but yeah, there's I mean, I'm sure there's also more inclusive ways of teaching it. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. I can't, I can't like, even believe you're allowed to say that this <laughs> Right, really. <laughs> oh my gosh. So you've been pole dancing for twelve years. Yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my was pole well, dancing the first aerial art you um, started? Because um, you are into other aerial arts as well. Um, do you mind going into a little bit of that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, pole was my first kind of like circus art that I got into. Um, and I, yeah, I did that for maybe four years or I don't know, for a while in my hometown. And then when I moved uh, to go to grad school, then like in the Bay Area, then I, you know, I was like, where, where can I go do some pole? And I found a circus school. And so after that, I got into a lot of different circus arts. Um, so I do a lot of, so I've been doing aerial hoop now for quite a long time too. I like that. Um, and I've dabbled it. I mean, I pretty much tried every aerial art. Um, and I've done a lot of training in like contortion and some hand balancing and like partner acro too. Wow, that's so amazing. A, um, I know contortion. <laughs> I can't even imagine that's such a wide variety of things. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that's that's a lot of things. But you have you... a <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> a performance troupe and um is it just pole or is it all aerial or is it would you tell us about pole diversity oh yeah totally so yeah pole diversity has definitely evolved throughout the years so i think um when i first created um the group the goal was to share my passion for pole um i mean pole is always going to be my absolute favorite circus art um, and I wanted to kind of showcase it in a circus setting was my original goal. Um, cause I think a lot of people are a little confused if it is like part of circus or, or not, but to me, like circus is just about creating shapes with your body and maybe with an apparatus. So I think it's very much a part of pole or a, yeah, pole is a part of it. Um, and then I also wanted to really showcase the diversity in styles of pole dance because there's so many different styles um, as well as the diversity in the community 
So like my first show that I put on, I mean, I had a cast member who was 15 and then I had a cast member who was like um, in her 50s. And every all of us came from like very different backgrounds and we all had different styles. And I just really wanted to showcase all of that with the local community. Um, so that was kind of how Pull Diversity started. Um, now it's kind of just the general like umbrella sort of group that I, I like do all of my different circus arts activities under. So now it does um, include other, you know, like any circus art kind of, but the focus is a little more on pull. That sounds so much fun to be able to perform and get to do it traveling. Um, how what um, how far have you been able to travel? It's in the California area. So yeah, mostly with my group, I've just been around California. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've also been hired to like perform under you know other people's like with other people's groups and things like that. And. I haven't quite announced it yet because I haven't like signed the contract yet, but it looks like I'll be going on a little tour um, around the Southwest um, in the spring. So I'm super excited about that. <laughs> That's so exciting. Congrats. That's awesome. Hell yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, Jay. That's the, that's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> and do, do you all um, do choreographed pieces or is it um, everyone does their own thing or is it like a, like a group show? Yeah, so sometimes I hire uh, soloists, so then I would have them, you know, choreograph their own thing, which I think, you know, if you are doing a solo, it's always better that you're, you know, doing the tricks that you want to do and things like that. Um, but then I always like to have um, kind of like a, at least a beginning and an outro, like group act. Um, and sometimes even at like a middle act too, to kind of like, you know, bring everything together. And so for those, I choreograph those um, with, you know, input from the dancers, too. So I always like to like I usually have an idea of kind of what I want it to look like. Um, and then as I start working with dancers, watching how they move and then trying to, you know, put all that together. So everyone feels good about all the movements and showcases everyone's strengths. That sounds so awesome. It sounds so fun. I, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> like that's definitely something that I would love to do as well. <laughs> yeah, there's also this local, um, every year we have, uh, so I'm in Santa Cruz. So every year, year we have Santa Cruz Dance Week. And it's, you know, we I don't get paid for this event, but it's like one of the free events that I really love doing because the whole, they shut down part of downtown and um, like a lot of Santa Cruz locals come around and you get to see all the different dance groups. And I choreographed like a 10 minute set with my group um, showcasing pole. And it's, yeah, it's so much fun. I love doing that. That's awesome. Especially for the community too. Yeah. <laughs> so many performance opportunities out there. That sounds so fun. Right? <laughs> yeah. How long has the, the group been going? Um. Let's see. I think I started pole diversity in... 2014 or yeah i think so <laughs> so it's been a while <laughs> yeah wow and, and do you want to tell us what um how you made it through covid with the performance troupe did you guys stop or or did you yeah, go online um, <laughs> i did try to go online um that was a pretty like kind of scary at first um it was very you know like trying to make a living off, you know, being a circus artist is kind of hard and unpredictable. Um, and so I usually line up kind of like a bunch of different jobs or, you know, like part-time work and like contracts and things so that if one of them falls through, I've got three other ones or if two fall through, I've still got two other ones. Um, and then it was like within a week, like I lost like three major sources of income and that was pretty scary, especially because with like performance work too, it's not like, you know, like you're just like an at will employee if you're an, even an employee. And it's not like, you know, you get some time to like find another job or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, that that was pretty scary. And then I felt pretty um, disconnected, I think, from my community, too, because 
um, how I connect with people is just kind of through circus arts. Um, so I did try to, I started teaching a little bit online, which was, eh, I, I definitely preferred, uh, like at least for like the group classes, um, I preferred doing those like in person. Um, but I did do that a little bit. And then I, um, did some performances online too, but it's so different. The energy just isn't there. Like you need to have like all the people in the room, you know, and like hear them cheering and stuff. And yeah, so that, that wasn't as much fun, but <laughs> I'm glad things are back. <laughs> <laughs> right right it seemed re really bleak for quite a while I had a, a circus circus performance troupe as well and we didn't make it through school then because I was like there's no way yeah, yeah. And, that's awesome. right. that's awesome. but that's amazing yeah. that you're still here and you're still yeah. being awesome <laughs> and you're also an instructor yeah. Um, and for, um, do you mean for circus arts or for math? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. For both actually. I was going to talk both, to you about yeah. this. <laughs> um, yeah. So I do, I do a lot of coaching. I, I really love teaching. Um, and I mean, I love having the chance to share my passion with other people and get everybody excited about pole and like get really nerdy about you know, biomechanics and things like that. Um, and I love working with each individual to, you know, like find the best path for them to learn, you know, a skill or get to their goals. Um, you know, I think it requires like a lot of problem solving. And so that makes it, you know, really interesting, I think to me. Um, yeah. So I love coaching. So I, I do that. Um, most of my time is probably spent doing that. And you teach at two different circus studios. Yeah, I currently teach um, at uh, Cirque Tumble Cheer, which is in the Capitola Mall, near in, which is near Santa Cruz. And then I also teach at Magnetic Pole Fit in San Jose. Um, and yeah, sometimes I do workshops at other studios. Um, and I do have like online options too. I was going to ask about that as well. <laughs> and you also teach math. You're so busy. Like, how do you do it? <laughs> yeah. So um, when I was kind of starting out in, you know, in circus arts, like kind of transitioning, I think, from like being a student to being doing it more professionally. Um, yeah, I was doing math a lot more um, to pay my bills. And but then I got to a point um, some years ago where I can kind of uh, support myself now on my circus arts income, which is pretty, <clears throat> pretty exciting. Um, but I was definitely really happy when I lost all my circus arts jobs in the pandemic that I had math in the, you know, as an option too. Um, and I also I, I love doing math as well. And I think my approach to like teaching is very similar for teaching math and teaching circus arts. And I don't really feel like I could do like live without doing both in some way. <laughs> I, I know that. when I was when I was reading your bio, I I um I noticed that you were like combining math and pole dance and and we at once um, combined physics with pole dance. And I'm not really like a physics or science person, but after we did that, I, I enjoyed <laughs> physics. But, so I really appreciated that you're combining math because that was another thing that I just didn't understand. But I feel like if somebody were to just combine it with pole, I could like understand <laughs> math oh, equations. Yeah. <laughs> I could go on and on about teaching practices in math too, because I think it is often taught in a very exclusive way. And a lot of people get math anxiety or just, you know, things like that, like very early on. And um, like most people don't get to see what's exciting about math. Like, I can't believe that, you know, most people's experience of math is like doing a bunch of computations and like trying to do them really fast to, you know, get you know a high enough score on in timed exam but that's like not what math is like math is about problem solving and there's a lot of creativity um you know you have some problem that you haven't seen you know the exact way to solve it yet and so you have to create your own way 
to solve that problem. And that's not something you would do in a timed test. Like there shouldn't, it shouldn't really be timed like that for doing actual math, but that's my thought on that. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. I, I used to love math. It was one of my favorite subjects, but always you're right. Like having to do it a certain way. And if you don't do it that way, it'd be considered wrong. It was very frustrating because I was, I wasn't like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it limits the discipline too. Like when we say like, this is the only way to do it, you know? So that's yeah. right. Then you're like, I don't like that then. Yeah. I know yeah. there's so many ways. <laughs> that's just one way. Yeah. 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 Developing a new way to do it is going to help develop the field, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that actually segues right into your blog. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. I really appreciated because, um, and I wanted to say I really identified with like the way that you described how your body compensates because I felt like mine does a lot of similar things to yours. And I was like, wow, because <laughs> um, the way that you talked about the thread throughs and, um, you know, I, I also find that that students get into issues with the thread throughs and everyone's body's different. and. Um, just finding all the different ways and, and leaving it open to like, there's a million ways um, because there's a million bodies, you know? Yeah. yeah do you want to talk yeah. a little bit more about your blog before I talk? <laughs> yeah. So this is a topic I'm super passionate about. Um, yeah. I mean, for a lot of different reasons. I mean, I think originally, it, you know, I started thinking about these things when I felt limited by my own coaches and um and even you know discouraged um and then i mean i am pretty stubborn and uh determined so you know if i felt like i couldn't do a skill then i would go home and like keep working on it and eventually i would figure out like well maybe i just change this one little thing and now i can do something that's pretty similar and cool as well um like I think so one of the skills I talked about in my blog too was um like eagle so eagle you know like the contortion grab in a ballerina um so since I did a lot of contortion and I did like needle sc scales so you know kind of a similar position on the ground um I was like well I should be able to do it on the pole but of course things are always harder on pole because you know you can't necessarily bend the way you want to bend or the way you do on the ground because maybe the pole's like jammed into your back. <laughs> um, so things are a little bit different. And so for a long time, like, I mean, I think I worked on it for, you know, some number of years probably. Um, and then eventually I was like, realized if I just straightened my bottom leg, I could do pretty much the same thing. And some people even are like, well, that looks even more bendy. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I was like, yeah. And so then I started doing that with a lot of skills um and it's i mean it's really fun so usually now you know sometimes i get inspiration from watching you know someone else's trick or combo and so i might start as that like an idea for my own training um but then pretty quickly you start going like a slightly different way with how depending on how my body moves and what feels good on me and what my aesthetic preferences are too which might be a little bit different as well um, so that was kind of how, you know, I started thinking about these things. Um, but then also of course with coaching pretty quickly, I noticed that, um, you know, like even with the thread through that I mentioned, like thread through to Superman, um, for me, it was so natural to just bring the knee through. So that's internal rotation of the hip, it, you know, or at least the way I'm doing it. Um, and then I think one of the first students I taught it to, she just automatically put her foot through first using a lot of external rotation. And then I was like, well, yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that in this position. So, and, you know, and noticing, you know, when I'd watch students do things and trying to help them figure out how to, you know, do the movement I was teaching, then I would realize like, yeah, they can do it that way. That's another safe way to do it. Um, and yeah, I think it's really important that as coaches, we help, students find the best way for them to get to a skill um and also the variation that they like the aesthetics of too which can be different um instead of just saying like this is the way to do it like 
And if you look at enough bodies, nobody's doing it exactly the same way. Like we're all doing it a little bit differently because we have different bodies. So yeah, I talk a lot about that in the blog. <laughs> I love that you mentioned that. Um, it brings me to a question because one of the things we wanted to um, add this season was talking about um, important topics and um, you're right. Every body type is different and we all do different um we all get into tricks and combos in different ways do you fi find sometimes in competitions worldwide um because of our body types and because we do different things that hinders us from like reaching those goals that they're wanting in the competition settings Oh, yeah. So I think that was why I kind of stopped doing competitions. I found it restrictive and not very rewarding and kind of stifled my creativity in ways, you know, and then when you're preparing for a competition, it's like you kind of just start working on those skills that you're going to put in your routine instead of getting to have the whole playtime, which is what I love. Um, and so, yeah, pretty quickly, I just started performing, which, you know, to me, it, it feels so much better. Um, there's not pressure to, you know, maybe do the hardest skill that you can. Like if I feel a little off one night, I can just modify a trick. It doesn't matter. Like everything I do is going to look pretty impressive anyway. Um, and yeah, and then I can be as creative as I want with like what I choose to include. Um, and I did feel at, I mean, in various competitions and I know, you know, and I haven't been competing like for a while now. So I'm sure people are, you know, maybe working towards more inclusive criteria, judging criteria and things. But I did think that sometimes, or maybe a lot of times there were, there was a lot of preference for certain aesthetics or like you, you know, you know, it can, is swearing okay? It's, <laughs> I remember yeah, a point, there was like this shirt that everyone was like, I guess we thought it was funny, like point your fucking toes, you know, um, that coaches would wear and stuff. And it's like, that's, you know, in general, like that isn't a necessary cue. Like, I mean, I do think you should be intentional about your shapes if you're, you know, trying to create a performance piece. Um, and so you should choose, like, do I want it to look pointed? Do I want it to look flexed? And, you know, things like that. But, you know, also if a student's not going to be performing and they don't care about that, then, like, it doesn't matter. Like, there's very few skills where, like, a pointed foot improves the safety of the skill. And if it actually does, I think it should be explained to the student. Like, if I ever give a correction or, like, a suggestion, I'm you know, I think it's important that we always know why we're telling somebody to do something a certain way. Um, and then, you know, I mean, ultimately it's kind of up to them, you know, um, it's like if a student is, you know, internally rotating their shoulder in an overhead position, which there are some skills that we do that load the shoulder in that position, um, you know, that that's not the most stable position for the shoulder to be in, in general. Um, and so I might, you know, if there's an option to then pull it into external rotation, I would probably give that correction to the student, but I would explain why I was giving them that correction. And that being said, there are a few people that I've seen who, you know, can, can do it kind of, you know, in a safer way. Um, though I wouldn't say that's, you know, so for most people, I would at least tell them like that might not be the safest position to load your shoulder in a lot, but. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Right. I, I think it's a good oh, Go ahead. I know the, the safety aspect of it because like, and, and students will think of it all the time. They'll be like, is this right? Is this wrong? And usually my answer is, as long as you're being safe, the thing is right. Like, even if you didn't do exactly what I just said, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I also want, I want students to appreciate their own bodies. Too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And their own movement qualities. Cause sometimes, you know, they're not going to be able to go into the combo that I did because my body is weird <laughs> and yeah. you know, I'm like, <laughs> Or, yeah. or sometimes they'll be able to get there, but it's not going to be the exact same way that you demonstrated. Yeah. 
Yeah. Or, or yeah, my pathway maybe doesn't feel good for them and a different one. Yeah. 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 I think as a coach, it's important to yeah help students learn about their bodies and find their own styles. Yes. And take ownership of their shapes. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I will say that was, um, they don't te- really teach you that in a certification. I mean, I actually, well, now they're adding it more with inclusivity, but I know when I took it, the earlier certification, it wasn't really, you got to be mindful of the different ways people get into things. It was like, this is how you do it. <laughs> you got to help them do it this way. Um, so at first it was kind of eye opening. Um, but I'm so glad I learned it that like all our bodies are different. They'll get there how they get there when they get there. Like you can't rush them and you can't like expect them to do it this way, set in stone. Yeah. It was a humbling experience and I think a lot of instructors should and coaches should have that experience for sure. Yeah. Right. That's why that's good that you thank you for that blog because that it's an easy way to, yeah. you know, just think think about all of those things and you know yeah. how we can just improve really easily <laughs> and we will have the link to that blog in the comments yes. for all the viewers and listeners to access <laughs> <laughs> well i guess back to your your personal um do you have any um training styles or philosophies you'd like to share yeah um so i think yeah. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about is, um, you know, everyone's going to have a day that feels like a bad day. <laughs> you know, it always happens and it's, you know, I mean, it happens pretty regularly, I think, when we're, you know, working on something and it's not working out the way we wanted it to. Um, and I think it's just really important not to be discouraged and not to feel like your training session was not you know, productive because, you know, you're still building your strength. You're still building, you know, the connections in your brain, like training your brain towards that skill. Um, And so I try to really focus on, you know, maybe just conditioning or something if I feel like I'm having um, a rough day with a skill. And I also try to, um, uh, when I train, I usually also start with like a few goals for that day um, no more than three. And, you know, so like one to three kind of main things I want to focus on. And, um, you know, and cause when I was younger, I think I used to, you know, go through Instagram and I'd be, have all these like tricks saved <laughs> and I would start one and I didn't get it, get frustrated. And then I'd go to the next one and maybe try 10 things that I couldn't do. And that's like, not super, uh, probably not a great way to get to those skills. <laughs> so now I try to limit myself to a few things and, um, you know, and now if I do ever use like Instagram as inspiration, which I don't need to so much anymore, but when I do, it's, uh, that's what it is. It's an inspiration. And then I try to take it and make it my own. And usually, you know, one thing I see on Instagram can turn into like 10 different ideas for me to explore. Um, so yeah, so I, def- I think, uh, my style of training is, um, you know, I guess allowing, you know, or yeah, being kind of creative with the process, I guess. And, um, looking at how to like break a skill down into like little pieces and create like a skill ladder to progress to my bigger goals. Thank you for sharing that with, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a really good, good training schedule, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I also limit it um, now. I also was like you when I come to the studio with a million different things <laughs> and then leave with nothing. But yeah, and you're right. You can always pull conditioning out of your back pocket and be like, back. I can do that. <laughs> if nothing else is working out. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing this. <laughs> do you happen to have a favorite poe trick or a poe nemesis that you're currently trying to condition? (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I was like looking at that question, favorite poe trick, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't pick one. (laughs) So I was able to narrow it down to three categories, which I know is still pretty broad. (laughs) 
Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I love deadlifts. Like I think strength is definitely like by strength. <laughs> I, um, so yeah, everything with deadlifts and cup grip is by far my favorite for a lot of different reasons, but it was the first deadlift that I got. Um, and then the next category I call these, uh, spinning loops. Um, so for I, spin pull is definitely my, my favorite, um, uh, over static, but so spinning loops on spin where you pick one trick or shape to start in and you move with your spin through a few transitions to end up at the same shape. And I just, I don't know, it's fun and I find it really interesting to work on. So I have a lot of those that I've created, like, you know, I mean, ballerina is a great one to start in. There's so many pathways from there to end up back into ballerina or like sailboat or inverted poses too. Um, and then the third one is just, uh, is like back bendy shapes. So I, you know, splits were uh, something that took me a lot longer to get. So back bending was a lot more natural for me. Um, and you know, I love anything back bendy if there's a contortion grab, um, especially like side bendy things. Um, and then, so my favorite one for that, that I've created recently is a trick I call crotalis. Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably my new favorite for that. <laughs> crotalis. This crotalis. <laughs> right. Uh, that sounds excited, scary, but excited. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I should explain where it comes from. It's uh, it's uh, one of the Latin names for uh, a certain type of rattlesnake. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to see it. I probably won't right. be able to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I could definitely, I'm sure you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a splitter. <laughs> yes. Do you have any um, conditioning advice? Um, because you mentioned that you love deadlifts and I made it my goal right. this year for 2023 to do deadlifts and muscle ups. Um, that is my goal for this year. Do you have any conditioning um, tips you'd recommend for myself or anybody else who's like, I'm ready for that? Definitely. Oh, I, I've got a ton of tips. So actually one of my new projects is to develop an online uh, deadlift course. So hopefully yeah. it'll be up in a few months. Um, but so a few things. So first of all, think about, I guess, which grip you want to start in, because, you know, if you're starting in twisted grip or true grip, or grip <laughs> I already know it's cup grip. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then you need to think about how you're conditioning your pulling strength for whichever grip you choose for the, the top arm. And then you need to condition the pushing strength. So sometimes I think, you know, in pull, we do a lot of things are a little bit more on the pulling side. Um, and so a lot of us, I think have maybe more pulling strength. Um, and so we need to balance it out with also being able to push because you have to push really, really freaking hard to get up. <laughs> um, and then making it, uh, you know, so taking it lower. So I think working on like handstands, the handstand version of whichever one is a really good place to start. And, you know, so like for a muscle up, that's very similar to a handstand press. Um, and then if you can't do the handstand press, then keep taking it lower. You could do a forearm stand press, uh, it does require a little more shoulder mobility. So, you know, that for not necessarily the best option for everybody, but for some people, um, and then, yeah, I mean, I've got a million exercises <laughs> for those. Um, but those are like just some general tips, I guess I would say, um, We'll have to stay tuned for those online courses. Oh, I, I do have one more. I, I forgot. <laughs> uh, so yeah, training the negative or like, you know, coming down. I think that's a really important skill that a lot of people maybe it's like, I think a lot of us know we should do that and it's hard. So we don't do it. <laughs> but if you can't control lowering down, you probably are going to be able to lift up. <laughs> um, so like if you're working on, you know, so working on lowering into iron X, that's a great way to work on a deadlift, um, too. And like lower down as much as you can lift back up, try to spend a lot of time lowering down and even pausing in your lowest, you know, point and lifting back up and that'll help a lot too. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I definitely, you're right. We know about the negatives and I always try, but you're right. They suck in. 
I will push them away if I have to. <laughs> right, we're like, I'm done with this thing. Plop. <laughs> I know, but she also bring, um, they also bring up a good point with the pull. We're often strong with the pull, and I find I'm strong with the pull, but that push is a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Right. That's why I'm glad you mentioned the handstands because I, I noticed since I started incorporating handstands, everything has gotten so much more balanced. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to have to add more of those. Interesting. I started yeah. to, and I think you're right. I saw some improvement that I don't know what happened. I just removed them. Yeah. Because once you get them, you're like, I got them. But then they go away. <laughs> I never got them. I stopped them before ah. I stopped them. Before I got them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> handstands are now, it's, I, it's one of the things I pretty much always like start with when I warm up, you know, and like just do wow. a couple of those sides and then start doing my muscle ups. And if you think about it, like the handstand to a muscle up, like it's pretty much the same strength. Like if you can do a handstand press, you sh probably can do a muscle up with your bottom hand, like right next to the floor. Yeah. Yes. 2023. <laughs> I got close. I got close to like the forearm press up. I was so proud of that. But yeah, I've always had issues with this. My shoulders always kind of cave. Um. So then work on. Um. So yeah. So something that's weird with forearm stands and stuff like that is you know we're not used to pushing through our elbows. If you think about it, like that's a very weird kind of thing. Um. So I suppose you know like with climbing, that's maybe the first way a lot of people learn how to do that. Um. But then work on like forearm planks and just make sure you're pushing as hard as you can, protracting your shoulder blades. Um, and then you can work on like, I think it's called dolphin and yoga when you like a downward dog, you know, okay. and then working on pushing, but then make sure you're not going into internal rotation. So you can use like, um, a band around your elbows too, to help with that. Um, or like holding a block, like a yoga block too. Um, and then working on, I mean, also a really good warm up for pole or, you know, any kind of like back bends and the overhead things um, like hold a block between your elbows and then like, see, this is hard for me. My hands are already starting going yeah. in, like try to go <laughs> up and get your, you know, shoulders to open. And it's <laughs> like, most of us are going to go in a little and it feels like, Oh, I can do it with my arms straight and your arms. And it's like, Oh, I guess I was cheating a little bit, <laughs> but yeah, that's really important for, also just for shoulder health, but yeah. <laughs> right in the handstands, I always have to remind my arms that they are now legs. <laughs> Too funny. My shoulders are now hips. <laughs> I'll have We're to keep this. working on that. Oh my. So yeah, I've One, always, uh, I always wished that I could walk with my arms. Like I don't, my hips don't work right naturally is what I always felt like. Um, yeah, I had a lot of hip pain for different reasons. And so that's why I was always, you know, I loved being on my upper arms and like doing everything that way. If I could have like monkey bars in my house and just like walk around like that, <laughs> that would be really nice. <laughs> I love it. But it. Oh my goodness, you'd be like ripped, so buffed. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be kind of fun though. Yeah. Then you'd have like less things on the floor and stuff. <laughs> I know the next warrior ninja by the time you're done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> what did you call the, the group of tricks that you like on the spin 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 pole? Oh, like spinning loops. Spinning loops. <laughs> I call the them um bookends. The <laughs> bookends. Okay. Yeah, I also like doing that. <laughs> nice. Oh, I, I was going to say bookend. That sounds familiar. I'm not going to it's, it's a special store. In, in the <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, not the store. <laughs> yeah, when you start in the same same trick and then you end in that same trick. <laughs> yeah, it's in your spinning loops. <laughs> yes. I don't think, believe it or not, I don't think I've ever fucking tried that. <laughs> I'm ah. gonna have to try it. 
<laughs> they're fun. It's like I'm, I always feel like I've completed a riddle. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never even I've never even thought about that. That would, that sounds like a good fun workshop. <laughs> that, yeah, you're right. We should do a workshop like that. <laughs> that's actually, that's actually one of the workshops that I uh, offer too. <laughs> oh, that's oh awesome. I was going to mention if that was one of your like courses. That would yeah. definitely yeah. <laughs> and you're go ooh a tour soon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, um, what uh, what kind of hand and body grip do you use when you pull down? Um, uh, my go to is just you know the the classic dry dry hands. That was the first one I tried, and it worked really well for me. Um, I do think it's more. It, you know, it doesn't work as well, I think, for people who have drier skin, which is is not me. Um, but yeah, that's my go to. <laughs> um, it doesn't change at all throughout the season. No. <laughs> oh, so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Mine changes all the time now, but you're right. I think, I think my skin is more drier now because I can't use the dry hands anymore. It's over. <laughs> well, dry hands got really expensive over the pandemic. I oh, almost yeah, I did hear that. Yeah. Switch. Um, but I, I did find out because they're when I you can actually order through their website. And for a really long time, they said that they were out of stock. But then I emailed them and they actually sold me some. So just putting it out there. <laughs> and that's the only way I can afford it now because then I get, you know, a case of them. Right, That's and awesome. not for they Amazon. <laughs> they don't want to, they don't want like, to close that. Off. Right, go to the source. <laughs> well, Amazon is how to, I think they buy it in bulk and then they just resell it. <laughs> yeah, it's like twenty five dollars, I think. Yeah, like, that's uh, just to make stuff. I mean, it's genius. Make money at home just by ripping people off. <laughs> <laughs> you can sell right. it. I've heard people actually replicate the formula on their own. Like if you search it online, people have recipes for it too. I haven't tried it myself, but I think, yeah, that's another affordable way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, for sure. I've, I've seen like the homemade recipes and then I've seen the ones where you send to like a factory overseas and they say they're going to like put the ingredients in, but you really don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah I haven't heard about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, um, <laughs> the non dry hands, dry hands. <laughs> well, do you have any advice for uh, beginner pollers? Yeah, um, I mean, I have a lot of advice. <laughs> um, I think the main thing is, you know, and this, uh, I mean, ties into it. So like, you know, find a good coach, you know, that feels good for you and makes you feel good. And you feel like is productive, um, like creates a productive, I guess, team with you. Um, but also don't let anybody hold you back. Um, I mean, sometimes as a coach, it is my duty to tell somebody like, you know, maybe you're not ready to throw yourself upside down on one arm. Um, maybe that's not recommended right now, but that doesn't mean that there's not some progression that I can offer to help somebody work towards that skill. And I think, I mean, this ties into like what I talk about in my blog, but I think there are a lot of times that personally I felt held back and I've also seen people hold other students back and, you know, like, fortunately I'm determined. So like, I didn't let it stop my pull progress, but I've seen other people get like like maybe they would never do pole again because they felt like it, you know, their body can't do that. That was like essentially the message that they got. And I think that's really sad and not true. Like there's always something that we can offer a student to help them work towards that. Um, so yeah, so don't let anyone, you know, prevent you from pursuing your goals. Um, and yeah, finding a good coach. And I, I do think it's helpful to find a coach I mean, somebody who's really experienced is great. Um, and then also having a coach that maybe moves similarly to you or has similar, you know, a similar body, I think is helpful. Um, but, you know, diversity in coaches, I think is really good too. That's what I've always tried to learn from as many people as possible. And I think that was really helpful for me. 
I love that. Thank you for that advice. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, I do have another question that wasn't on the thing. If you don't want to answer, uh, we could always erase this part or please feel free to be as honest. Um, you mentioned to us at, when we were corresponding that you are artist, autistic. Um, do you have any advice to studios, coaches, on um, how we can make our environments more inclusive for other people who may be on the spectrum? If you don't mind talking about that. Oh yeah, um, definitely. I could, I can talk a lot about it for sure. Um, so, uh, so first of all, I did create a document that I give out freely, um, to studios and coaches, um, with suggestions for how to create more inclusive spaces. Um, uh, so that's available. So happy to share that with anybody who wants. And I also offer that as a workshop that I can do at studios as well. Um, I do want to say that, you know, autism is, you know, can present very differently for different people. So I am obviously most familiar with my own experience as an autistic person. And, you know, my experience is very different than somebody who maybe can't speak. So, um, so the suggestions that I'm offering are more for um, people who probably are diagnosed with like ASD one. Um, but uh, yeah, so one of the things um yeah, I mean, so I, I one of the things I think I mentioned to you guys when we were talking over email was about how I communicate. And I always kind of feel like this is something I have to tell people at the beginning, because if I don't, I often feel either that there's, you know, I misinterpreted or communication doesn't go smoothly or that even people have like judged me pretty harshly. Um and, you know, that's in all different spaces. So a lot of pole spaces and other spaces. Um, so I, you know, have a little more trouble understanding non-literal communication. So I do really appreciate like kind of clear, direct instructions and things like that. Um, sometimes like references just completely go over my head or, um, you know, and I'll, I'll interpret something very literally and then everyone like maybe laughs at me and then it's like really embarrassing. <laughs> um, that's happened a lot. Or people, I think sometimes just think I'm like kind of weird or, or like, um, or standoffish too. Um, so yeah, communication is just very different for autistic people. Um, and in, and in different ways. Um, and so, you know, trying to be to, I mean, I think everyone should try to learn a little bit of, you know, how to communicate with people who communicate differently than you. Um, I mean, I think I was forced to learn how to communicate in a more neurotypical way, which is like somebody who doesn't have something like autism or, you know, ADHD or things like that. Um, but I think almost no neurotypical people spent any time learning how to communicate in a way that made sense to me or made like information accessible to me. Um, so that's one. And um, nonverbal communication, I know, is really big for um, most people. I mean, I think, you know, they say that like most communication is nonverbal, but I think so definitely for me and for a lot of autistic people, I think, um, you know, like we may not naturally like express a lot of things on our faces and that's you know not uni universal but like uh, for me I had to teach myself how to smile like I remember being a teenager and at some point I realized that people were really confused or even like thought I was like angry at them and um and I was like why why does this keep happening and then at some point I realized it was because I wasn't smiling so they thought I was angry or bored or something. And I felt, I remember feeling like really frustrated that they didn't just ask me like what, you know, cause I would have told them. And then sometimes, you know, people, I would even tell them like, no, I'm enjoying this time right now. And then they wouldn't believe me. <laughs> and that was like really frustrating. And, uh, you know, so, um, so maybe not having expectations with us, you know, for a certain communication style and like um, things like that. Um, and then as far as, you know, like more specific to learning movement, um, 
a lot of autistic people might have dyspraxia, um, which is, you know, means it's like harder to kind of feel what's happening in your body and it can make you look less coordinated too. Um, and so for me, like tactile cueing and also like watching myself was really important for me to learn. And so some studios, and I know this is like to kind of create a safe environment sometimes, but some studios have policies about no filming, but for me, that makes it really difficult. Um, so I pretty much have to film everything I do. And so I'll try something and record it. And then I watch it immediately and then I try it again. And that's how I kind of learn how to feel my body better. Um, and so I think having a way for students to do that if they need to is really important. Um, you know, I mean, I could go on and on. There's a lot of stuff <laughs> in the document. Um, I think maybe the only other thing I'll mention right now is I think, um, you know, sometimes I felt like there's an expectation as a circus artist that I have to be really charismatic and present in a very specific way that is not natural for me. And I don't think that has to be like included in the definition of circus artist. I think there's lots of ways to do it and be good at it. And, you know, I don't think we should expect um, everyone to like be super bubbly and things like there was even a studio I actually used to work at, which, and then I quit. Um, it didn't feel good. I kind of felt, yeah, like the owner was always um, expecting me to be more outgoing and I was basically doing the best I could, but it wasn't natural for me to be overly outgoing. And at one point she was like, you're the only person I have on staff who's not, you know, really outgoing like this. And, but like, kind of felt like a backhanded, like, or like kind of, you know, a criticism that she wanted to tell me without like really saying like she wanted me to be different and yeah so stuff like that I think maybe we should be a little more careful of thank you for thank sharing you. that um because I know oftentimes we don't think about things like that especially because when a student comes in we don't know <laughs> what's going on in their life we don't know what um they have if they're on the spectrum or what so it's nice to share and learn different things that might be going on and how we can kind of understand and learn from that and make it more welcoming i don't know yeah. if that makes sense i hope that makes sense <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Often, yeah, definitely. yeah oftentimes we like i feel like sometimes people judge um other people and they don't know what's going on yeah, especially yeah. in a fitness class dance environment. Yeah. And it's definitely oh. not always safe. You know, it may not always feel safe for people to say what they have going on if it's different. Um, and then there's also the issue of that a lot of people, especially non males, uh, don't get a diagnosis of autism until much later, if ever. And also, that process is, you know, not accessible to everybody either. Um, I had a pretty late diagnosis, so I didn't even know for for most of my life. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Right, though, but the, the expectations of other people, we need to, like, let them go, especially, you know, as teachers. Um, and sometimes it, that's, like, you expect your class to go a certain way, but you always have to be more curious uh, of everyone, you know, yeah, rather than expecting them. Yes, and I guess a, a good point to as students as well, because um, she has this experience as teachers, we never know how students portray us too. Yeah. So if you're a student out there, try to be understanding of that new instruction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for what you're used to. Yeah. And it's, right. and it's, it's, you know, it's okay for, you know, like I'm not going to be the perfect teacher for everybody. Um, and that's okay too, you know, um, I think, I mean, I remember actually when that studio owner kind of, when I was kind of feeling that tension with her and like, I definitely get that a lot of people, when you're asking them to do something physically difficult, having somebody being really excited about it is maybe really helpful for them and what they want or need. But 
for me, I, when I took a class like that from one of the other instructors, I was like, I don't like this feels, it felt a little fake and like over the top and just like, I just wanted like the information and I didn't need that. So for me, it wasn't like my preferred kind of coaching style. And so that's why I think it's important for studios to have diversity in the staff as well. Yeah. And I'm glad you also brought that up too about like the staff and like um, studio owners and, and, you know, like being mindful of all of your instructors and everyone and making them feel, you know, like they're, they're loved and supported as well and not expecting things of them. Yeah. Thank you for bringing all of that up. A constant learning process for us all, for sure. Mm. Yep. Um, I guess what it, um, for your performance troop and for you as a um, as an instructor as well, where do you see yourself in the future? Um, so yeah, I just kind of want to continue, um, I guess, sharing some of the things I think are really important with teaching, like um, like I have been in my blog. Um, and I am going to start developing more and more kind of online at your own pace courses. And, but ultimately I want that to turn into an entire like instructor training course is like my bigger goal. That's going to take me a long time to, cause I'm kind of a perfectionist about stuff. Um, but yeah, so the deadlift course that I'm working on is going to be kind of the first step towards that. Um, and then I also just hope to be able to continue traveling you know, around more and like further and further out and, you know, teaching and performing all around the world <laughs> this is my goal. <laughs> I love oh, it. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for, for doing what you do. You have such amazing messages and, and the fact that you're um, willing to share them is, is, you know, so we're so grateful for that. And also the performance True, because there's not a lot of performance opportunities for pole dancers. Like you said, um, there's, you know, the competitions are not always for everyone. So thank you so much for, for doing so many awesome things for the pole community. Yeah, wow. for sure. yeah. Thank you guys for spreading a bunch of, you know, pole stories from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like our of course. <laughs> Is there anything else that you can think of that you want to promote or talk? Um, tell the audience um, we're going to share every link you send us in the comments um, so they can have easy access to that um, yeah. but anything I, are you uh, um, extra you want to share um, let's see so yeah I think I mentioned I so I do have some tutorials up already um, and you can request those through my Instagram account like my link in my bio there so like I've got a Janeiro one and I do have a twisted grip deadlift tutorial as well, though the bigger deadlift course is going to include a lot more than just that. Um, and yeah, I think I have about 10 different ones like that. Um, it's all pay what you can. Cause I, that's also something important to me too. Um, they all take me, they take a long time to make, but I also just want the information out there. Um, I have a blog where I try to share a lot of things. Um, you know, one of my documents is on like, uh, you know, how to be you know, like safety in pole dance. So talking about shoulders and wrists and things like that. Um, and yeah, my new one, adapting pole skills for different bodies, um, as well as like some, I go into some more personal stories too. So I did talk about like my experience with like being diagnosed with autism and things like that is on my blog as well. Um, and I just started um, creating, uh, doing some programming for mobility work. Um, so that's all online. So if you have a certain goal or if you just want to like, you know, increase your shoulder flexion range for pole, which is really essential for safety. Um, I can create a personalized program for you for that. Um, as well as just like online, you know, private lessons and things. So that's all through my Instagram or, or through my website. Yeah. So many awesome things. <laughs> so busy thank you for sharing that. <laughs> or do you have any um things that you do in your free time or do you have free time <laughs> <laughs> most of my time is yes yeah, spent moving and pursuing that 
Um, but yeah, when my body's tired, then I really love reading and learning. And also I like cooking when I have time to cook, I think, you know, and learning about the like science behind cooking too is really interesting. Um, so yeah, I guess those are the main things. <laughs> <laughs> love it. <laughs> yeah. So I think that was all the questions that I had, Chris. Um, a random question for all the math geeks. What is your favorite math topic? <laughs> so, yeah, I um well, so I did research like in um in pure math. Um, so yeah, pure math is like the like theoretical math where you're like proving things. So I'm definitely very far in that direction versus like the more applied direction. Um, I specifically wrote a paper on elliptic curves, which um, kind of relates to like, like number theory things. Um, like I really enjoy number theory and like more like algebra is like kind of the general topic. Um, though, yeah, one thing I'm interested in more recently is using math to analyze different movements in circus. Um, and so I do need to learn a little more physics for that, but if anyone's interested in doing some math circus art stuff, just going to put it out there. I'd love to collaborate. Um, you know, I also do statistics. So if you need data analyzed, <laughs> um, cause I have seen like, you know, there's studies now coming out, like people are starting to look at, you know, like injuries and in pull and things like that. And, um, I could definitely help with this, like analyzing the stats for that, but. <laughs> oh, that's so amazing. I love that. Thank you for sharing that math. Um, <laughs> I'm a software engineer major now, and math has always been a secret love, so it's always fun to talk a little <laughs> bit about it. <laughs> nice. yeah. Well, I could definitely send you some of my favorite problem sets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> Man, I wish I could, I'll, maybe I'll get interested in math. I always laugh because I'm like, I am a dancer, and all we have to do is know how to count to eight. <laughs> yeah. I really That's find awesome. like I really feel like only some people can teach math, and once you have that math teacher that really shows that it doesn't care how you get the answer or how you understand it, as long as you get there, then I think it changes the game for you. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and also yeah, like just presenting it in, in through pole dance will be helpful. For yeah. Me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh but i might be able to hook you up with my my friends who did the physics of pole dance yeah um, yeah they work at the uconn school of medicine so maybe that would <laughs> maybe yeah, could hook up and like come up with this whole like science and math and like awesome pole dance curriculum <laughs> yeah i can't wait to take it all <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, Jody, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. This was fun. I learned so much. Yes. And, and I guess we should we should sign out. Yeah. We're all ready. <laughs> I know. They always go so fast. I know. <laughs> well, thank you so much for listening and watching to this episode of Poll on the Call. My name is Mandy Mack. And I am Chris Rivers, and we are here with the amazing Riker of Pole Fantasy. <laughs> Thank you so much. We are signing off. Signing off. Oh. <laughs> Always with us. Yeah. Ooh, I love, <laughs> love it. <laughs>